Um, so starting off, uh, we're going to be asking, how do we make the 6G transformation profitable? Um, subsequent to that, we'll be trying to connect that through to between 5G to 6G. And then at the end, uh, we'll be looking at how we support the, the triple bottom line. So looking at value in ways beyond purely the commercial. Um, and then after that, uh, you get the, the reward for putting in the hard work of, of, of being here through all that. And, uh, and we go for drinks together just outside. So um, with that, I'm going to hand over to our moderator for this session, uh, Ken Figueredo. Okay. Um, I think I feel like we should make some noise. I mean, if everybody could clap or, or shout, it might encourage everyone in. Come on. Very good. <laughs> so, um, while, while they're coming in, let me explain why we're here. Um, I sat down with Alex last year and I complained to him that every event about 6G had something about spectrum scarcity, technology, terahertz communication, sustainability, and there was this enormous gap to talk about how the industry could make money. And um, that complaining worked, so uh, if you ever want to get onto a panel, complain to Alex and, and he'll invite you. So what we want to talk about is, is how can the industry um, succeed commercially, but also kind of like um, drive more vitality in the industry in terms of um, economic and business model ideas, okay? Um, the framework I'm gonna use is to talk about the industry structure and what works, because at the moment we have an industry where um, you have research and innovation, then you have standardization, then the vendors build standards in, in, in sort of hardware and software. The communication service providers um, get those capabilities and then they sell services to the customer. Okay, and so we're going from this idea of innovation feeds the value chain, right? Um, but that doesn't work anymore if you've been listening to what people are saying about 5G. And we need to think about how that value chain is changing or how it needs to change for the industry to succeed. So today, um, we've got um, Rajesh from Interdigital, who has a view about the innovation and standardization. We've got Eben from Echostar, who's in a sense representing the future generation of telecoms, the software telecoms communications service provider. And then Jeff Jefferson Wang from uh, Accenture Cloud, who sits closer to the enterprise. He can talk about what's um, going on in the market and, and market demand. And my old model was we're moving from left to right, but for 6G, we need to move from right to left. Demand and money, and how does that money flow through the industry mm -hmm. value chain? Okay, so um, I got a stack of questions. If, you, if you've got questions, line them up and I'll ask you in about 25, 30 minutes from now. I'm gonna ask each person to introduce themselves and talk a little bit about what their organization does and where it sits in the industry chain and, and, and what are they seeing in the context of 6G and then we'll move into Q&A. So, Jefferson. All right, uh, thank you Alex, thank you Ken for, for having me. I'm super excited to, to be on this panel. Uh, so I lead our cloud-first strategy for Accenture, and essentially Accenture is a 740,000 person professional services company. Um, before this, I actually stood up our network practice, and that network practice was focused on how do we help communication service providers with the entire value chain, uh, how do we help the chipset manufacturers and the device manufacturers put this together, and then ultimately, how do we actually help the, uh, the end user? Um, so maybe just some, some quick reflections uh, on this. When, when we were kind of prepping for this, one of the interesting things we, we went through is what can we learn from 5G and how do we apply it to 6G? And I, I thought some of the sessions before this did a nice job bringing up some of those tough questions. One around, you know, how do we start with profitability and what segments that we focus on? How do we think about monetizing differently from the telco? How do we actually think about innovation and drive this? So in, in a traditional model, if you, if you kind of looked at the consumer segment, that's where a majority of the profits have come from, right? And then in 5G, it shifted to saying, how do we actually change 
the value chain for enterprise clients. And then we realized very quickly that that was a long sales cycle. Uh, so that's what I'll be talking about mostly today because Accenture's 9,000 plus clients, most of them are in the enterprise across all the different industries, whether it's manufacturing that we talked about before, whether it's automotive and industrial to health uh, and safety and all those clients or utilities, but I'll be bringing up that point of view. So thanks Very for good. Uh, and Evan, you can talk about the that's a future oriented Thank you. communication service. My name is Evan, I work for EchoStar. Uh, most of you probably know Dish Wireless uh, way better. Um, that was the name of a very big science project. We don't talk about Dish Wireless anymore. As a matter of fact, if you say Dish Wireless at the office, you owe somebody five bucks. Um, so I'll see how much money I leave with today. Um, so we've, 2019, we had nothing. We had an idea that you could build an almost completely IT-centric network. Um, you could make Open RAN work uh, by sheer brute force. Um, and that it would be an excellent idea to build a nationwide network during COVID. Uh, today, we have over 20,000 uh, running cell sites. We have a national mobile network running completely in the public cloud uh, using Open RAN. Um, and that's the Boost Mobile side of EchoStar. Uh, it's the largest Open RAN network on Earth. It's the only uh, carrier network on Earth that runs completely in the cloud. Um, but the other part of EchoStar has a lot of satellites in it. EchoStar itself uh, has satellites, but DISH also with its background in television and media and compression technologies and a range of other things has a lot of experience in that domain. And the marriage between the two uh, poses for a lot of very interesting future discussions to have on non-terrestrial communication. We're the only organization that has global licensed S-band spectrum, uh, which helps to be able to do very interesting things with mobiles uh, and with satellites. And the fact that the cloud helps us to have an IT-centric approach to how we deploy carrier-grade core networks it means that location is effectively irrelevant to us. Um, and the marriage between those two, I think, is something that maybe we can unpack a little bit in terms of what we do today. Um, what we've learned is, we've learned that if, if the only thing that you're listening to is what everybody tells you what you cannot do, um, then in effect you will be stuck. And everybody said that the things that we're trying to do are impossible. And they were right. They were 100% correct. Uh, if you try to do those things in a, in a traditional fashion, you will have failed. Um, and I think one of the things that I'd like to integrate in the discussion today is if you keep doing what you always did, you will always get what you always had. But if we allow ourselves to think somewhat differently uh, to how to approach, in this case, 6G and the evolution of 5G, I do think that there is an interesting way forward, but it does not look like the road behind us. Um, so I'm looking forward to the next okay. discussion. Very good, Rajesh. Thank you, Ken. Um, so my name is Rajesh Pankaj. I'm a, a CTO of Inter Digital. Uh, compared to their companies, in terms of number of people, we are much smaller, but we, we work at a different end of the spectrum. Um, we, have, um, we, we are basically a pure research company. We have um, R&D labs in uh, wireless, in video, and in AI. The wireless lab thinks about you know, how to make cellular networks better. Uh, we do research, we take that research to standards. Um, the video lab tries to make sure how to, how to get the video more efficient and how to transport that more efficiently over wireless or wired network or any other kind of network. Um, and then AI lab thinks about how to apply AI to different types of wireless and video problems and occasionally think about how the, the stuff that comes out of video or wireless lab can be used for AI. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, you know, we think in terms of, look, uh, AI is going to be video, going to be using video. AI could be doing, um, you know, object uh, uh, detection on video. Uh, would you want to do video compression differently because of that? Because it, would, it could be more efficient compared to the video compression that's done for, um, you know, for human consumption. So, so those kinds of problems AI Labs is thinking about. Um, we are, um, you know, we have been named as uh, one of the hundred most innovative companies in the world in any, uh, in any field uh, by LexisNexis three years in a row. 
So I take great pride in that and, uh, and great pride in the fact that uh, I'm the one who is heading our engineering team who is doing all the research in all of these areas. Um, by um, by own, my own nature, I'm an optimist, so whenever Ken asks me some question about, okay, are you not happy about how things are going? My answer was always, I think we can do better. I think more things, better things will happen. So hopefully you will see that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, uh, my way of thinking uh, in, the, in the discussion. Okay, today. very good. Okay, so uh, the first question is about context. Uh, we heard on the last panel um, news that, um, 5G was the most successful in terms of being deployed, much faster than um, 4G. Um, but um, the commercial returns being um, disappointing. And I know, Eben, when we spoke, you said, you know, there's a lot in 5G that we can still work with. So my, my sort of opening questions are, do we need 6G or are we thinking too early about 6G? Yeah. So... My answer would be is that from every customer that we're currently speaking to, um, we do not see somebody asking us for things that we do not have the tools in the toolbox for. Um, I think 6G is a solution waiting for a problem to happen, uh, to come at it. If, if we were to think of, of 6G um, in terms of the, the large domains that potentially it could address, obviously, first and foremost on anybody's list will always be security. So sure, 6G can bring new security standards. Second thing could be, uh, probably the next most obvious thing would be some form of new waveform. Um, everybody would say the spectrum will always be a problem, um, and so finding a new waveform will be a really good idea. So let's, let's try and do a new waveform as well. And then it gets a little bit blurry. Um, you know, the European 3GPP, et cetera, is not 100% aligned on what to do then, but certainly AI has to be in there somewhere. Um, and what does it mean if you put AI in a node, in a network function, what exactly are you trying to achieve? We're not really clear on, on, on that yet. And then there are use cases around sensing and, and things like that. And the supposition that I want to put forward is that with an open RAN network that sits in the cloud, um, we have the ability to access a RIC, which is effectively a highly, highly, highly standardized, extremely integrated SOM, service order manager or orchestrator, that is directly connected to the scheduler and the radio, which means I have any amount of AI, any amount of processing and decision making directly connected to the scheduler of every single radio, which means we are today able to, on an open RAN network, we are able to manipulate the waveform. So this has in fact been demonstrated already, uh, Doppler manipulation and other things. So we don't even need, need to deviate from OFDMA. We can still stay on OFDMA and get 20 to 30 percent improvement just from Doppler manipulation. So we can manipulate the waveform already, and we intrinsically have AI in the core because we're in the cloud. And because we have the RIC, we can connect any of that compute decision making, whether it's at the edge or at the center, we can connect it to every single base station. Um, and then because all the threat surfaces in ORAN are intrinsically exposed, you have a lot of visibility around what, go what goes on with security. So a very, very short summary would say that at least 75 percent of what people are currently putting forward for 6G, I would say we can, we can take a very good shot at it with, with, with open RAN 5G as of next year. And in fact, we will be doing exactly that in, in 2025, doing exactly what I just said. So, so I think 6G absolutely needs to happen, but I think we need to, to your analogy from moving from left to right, we need to understand what exactly do we want to achieve before we start developing this technology. So I, I know Rajesh is, is dying to get into this. <laughs> you know, you, you have to be a successful innovation company. You, you have to look away into the future. So what's your optimistic view then? So here's one. Uh, Evan started by saying that, oh, we don't need 6G, but then he ended up with saying that, yeah, we do need 6G. And look, <laughs> we really do need 6G, okay? So here's the thing. Um, you talked about, you first said, well, everything that we need we are, we are there, but then you said only 75%. The 25% needs to come from somewhere. Somebody has to do that work. That's what we are doing. And then you, th you, you put together this vision that you have this open RAN that can do everything, but you did think about what the device can do that can be enhanced, and for that, then you need a standard so the device can actually talk to the rest of the network, right? So you do need 60. Um, 
there, there are lots of capa capabilities that everybody has been talking about that 6G does provide. AI is a big thing, whether you like it or not, and you can do a lot more uh, with AI, and not just in the cloud, but also in the device, okay? And so if you want to take full advantage of that, then you have to have some way to make sure that that connection is made between the device and the network side. Now, there is one other reason why you need 6G. For some reason, when a new G comes along, then governments get more excited about making spectrum available. And if that's the only reason why it needs to be called 6G, so be it. The way I think about it is that every release adds something new, okay? And, and, and at some point, um, there's enough new thing that you need to add that you say, well, let's call this thing 6G. And you have to think about that in advance. Just as, as was pointed out, it's not that you, know, the, the, you can't provide AI services right now. Of course you can. It's not that you can't pro provide sensing services right now. Of course you can, but you can do it better if you think about the system uh, design with those things in mind. Okay. So I, I, think, I think it's a nuanced point in between both of these, right? And it's interesting because in, f okay, we added everything, right? 1G, we went to digital voice, and 2G, we added text. 3G, we added kind of mobile internet. 4G, we added those things, right? So, so yes, we have added in each, and it naturally went on a very cookie-cutter model. And I think what, Evan, you're bringing up is interesting because it's like when we did 5G, it was built from the ground up to be enterprise-focused. But then when we went to it, we realized how hard it was to sell them to the enterprise. So then your sales cycle turned from one product of a device plus a megabyte that you're just going to sell how many to the enterprise to a solution. And that solution now went from a sales cycle of like a month to a year. So I think what's interesting about what both of you said is that it's really about when, right? And it's really about if you start, to your point, shift to the other side of what monetization is, is we in this room, you know, I grew up in telco, all you guys grew up in telco, everybody grew up in telco, we're excited about this because it's the next evolution, whether it's from more spectrum, whether it's from new experience, whether it's from new advice. But the enterprise looks at it and just says, you are one tool of many, right? You are one tool of Wi-Fi 6, you are one tool of LoRaWAN on IoT, you are one tool of shielded Ethernet, you are one tool of these things. So if you are not completely clear with your value prop, if you're not completely ready with your ecosystem, and if you're not very clear with how you're gonna save money in any industry, pick one, then I don't know how to use you. So what, what's interesting about what both conversations is, is really, when is the right time that we put enough into this? When is the ecosystem ready? And then we ultimately have a solution that can solve problems. If enterprise is the only story, and I think you and I talked about this, right? Yeah. And we'll we'll yeah. get into it. Enterprise isn't the only story. Yeah. And I think also what this points to is something structural in the industry is that um, different parts of the value chain are working to different time horizons. Okay, and that's just a, um, a, a reality. Um, I want to move on to the next topic, which is about industry structure, and um, also refer to a comment from the um, earlier panel about standardization being a little bit of a millstone. Okay, um, and I want to touch on two two aspects. One is the the whole standardization process, the sequence. Uh, and then the other thing that's structural about the industry is this transition from hardware to software, okay? So l let's begin first on the topic of the standards body and standardization. It's a good, effective governance model. It's worked in the past. What else is good about it and what else, what, what might change? What might help the, the industry as a whole? You want me to try to answer? Um, well, look, um, not everything has to wait for a new standard, right? Um, think about when iPhone first came about, it was not because of a new G, right? And not just that, we are not the only ones who, are, who can be accused of not thinking about how we fit in the rest of the ecosystem, okay? We, we often often we, we worry about those kinds of things. When iPhone first came about, 3G was at its peak, but it was a 2G device. They didn't have 3G connectivity because they thought, ah, device, cool device, that's all you need. You don't need good connectivity. Turned out, you did, right? Uh, and so, um, so, so it's not that you have to wait for standards to be ready to do anything new. Um, the thing that I, iPhone was able to do was uh, make an app store available that, uh, you know, that was open. I mean, before that, it was tried. There are other types of app stores that had existed before that. They, they sat in, in, uh, in different operators, you know, walled gardens. Um, but that app store was open. That allowed something like Uber to come about that Peter was talking about earlier. That you know took advantage of everything, every capability that was there. 
not something that we were thinking about. You know, so while now when we look at, we say, hey, we know what we're going from, when we're going from 1G to 2G, what we're looking for, or 2G to 3G, what we're looking for. But if you think about it, since 1960s, Telco were talking about video telephony. Nobody was talking about Uber. Uber came about because the right set of things were available, and they were made available to the app developers to think about what they can do with it. And we'll have to do something similar to, to make sure that the technology that the standardization process is making available is available to those who can make use of them. Okay. Now, I know when I spoke to you, Evan and, um, and Jefferson, you, you surprised me in a sense because it seemed to me that you follow what's going on in standardization quite closely. You talk in detail about the different releases. How is software manifesting itself in standardization? I mean, you... So, <clears throat> I very much support the initiative that the 3G-2G-D, despite my slightly provocative remark that we don't need to wait for 6G for a whole bunch of things to happen. Um, and we have the open source community, which has its own way of actually standardizing. Um, and that's been extremely successful uh, in achieving great innovation. And, and I mean, we wouldn't have Kubernetes, we wouldn't have Red Hat, you know, there's, 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 there's magnificent things we wouldn't have without the open source community. Um, and then you have bodies like Kamara and, and, and TM Forum and people like that are trying to help to create bridges between different domains of space because you've got kind of networking, telco space, and you kind of got the software space. But as these bleed into becoming looking like IT or could be behaving like IT, you do need some sort of a bridge. And that's where I think the standardization can actually really help us to accelerate. Um, we talk a lot about operators needing to change and operators needing to be able to present themselves and being easier to work with. And I completely 100% agree with what you said about the fact that 5G needs solutions, not just a data pipe like what we had on 2G. I mean, 2G had no product, it was voice. The product sold itself. Um, you just discussed price and volume. The product itself wasn't discussed. When, when, when you go to the CIO of an airport, he does, he's not talking to you about how many megabits your radio puts out. He wants a body cam with, with, with video filters on top, with image recognition, with intent, with this, that, and the other. He doesn't care about how much megabits comes out of your radio. He wants an end-to-end -end security solution. Um, and the standards can help us to do that. And what we're talking about is how can we have these APIs to interact with our customers? How can I give an API to Amazon? How can I give an API to you so that you can provide a solution and I back end connect to that solution? But those very north-south APIs that we will use to actually reach a customer could be used in an east-west fashion to federate, which means we could then federate networks together to be able to offer much more ubiquitous solutions. But that federation will require standardization. There will have to be a bridge between what I still, I guess we still call the IT layer and the network layer. That east-west and north-south are effectively the same kinds of APIs. But that standardization will actually unlock a tremendous amount of additional capability, which today is simply engineered out of solutions. Zoom doesn't need low latency to work because it never had it. So it engineered it out of its solution. Its solution works without low latency. And it doesn't help if the Telefonica Germany has it, but Vodafone UK doesn't. And Telefonica Spain has it, but we in the US don't. That doesn't help them. Their customers don't think that way. So federation across will unlock an entirely new dimension of innovation and service creation that we can do. So I think standardization is extremely important. Okay, so if you look at that, um standardization chevron in the value chain, okay? Is the, is 3GPP, which is central, capable of change? Or do we think that there'll be new forms of intellectual property? So intellectual property coming out of what 3GPP does, but different kinds of intellectual property around frameworks, application frameworks that might emerge from TM Forum or GSMA or, or the IEEE. I wonder if it's, even if you think about <coughs> what Stephen just said, right, that if you look at the value chain, uh, let's look at the value chain of the past for a quick second, right? The value chain of the past was the operators would spend an incredible amount on the spectrum 
And then because of that right of the airways, they would monetize against a business model. And when you look at 5G and what we can learn in the 6G is that we lost some of those control points. Right? So in, in 4G, we lost the control point of we gave up the megabyte as a control point. And it became a, you know, unlimited in most countries, you, some other countries haven't done unlimited yet or some throttling. That was one control point that was lost. That effectively became very difficult now when you move into this new world. The second thing was we sort of started to depend on one form factor. And we said, this is smartphone or bust. And when we got to smartphone or bust is, when we went through the other generations, we subsidized phones. I was building phones, feature phones for a long time. And we always, it was a $400 feature phone, we subsidized $200 and we proliferated feature phones, TNT device we used to call it. Then same thing early on in smartphones. We had a contract and we subsidized and we proliferated that and it created the app store and these economies. We've lost both of those as an industry. So the lead service of what we need to now put onto effectively 6G we still need to think about how we're gonna monetize this because it's incredibly costly for you to build these networks. And you are super efficient now in what you're doing, but at the same time, how do we think about, you know, what is software's role to allow you to test and iterate faster to get to the proposition? That, that's something you can do now that no one can do, right? Because now, like what you just described on wavelengths and beam forming, that's like a $20 million change order you have to like write in a traditional, where you can just do it by yourself. Right, so you're bending the cost curve a lot differently because of the network you've built, but that's the first step, right? If you can bend the cost curve differently, you can apply that savings, that $20 million change orders you're gonna write to that old value chain into what's new. But I think that there, there's a big discussion there that we gotta figure out because there's a lot of money being spent and all the monetization control points are lost right now. I think in the software world, innovation happens so quickly. Um, because you're not up against the laws of physics. The only constraint you have is how many cycles does the CPU have and how much RAM it takes. Outside of that, you are literally only constrained with your own imagination, which allows for innovation to take place at a tremendous pace, and more importantly, failure to happen extremely fast without catastrophe. In the physical world, as we've seen with SpaceX, with rockets falling over and things like that, Failure when you're dealing with the laws of physics takes a lot more time and is a lot more costly. So as you can remove the semblances of what looks like a hardware or a physical constraint out of networks and make them look like software, you're able to increase the innovation cycle. Um, and the reason why I have faith in that is that the only reason why our network even exists is because we've allowed ourselves to challenge that paradigm to leave only the absolute most irrefutable components left in hardware, such as a radio that's hanging on a tower. Pretty much everything else is software to be able to increase that innovation cycle, which then allows things like virtualization, CICD pipelines, which allows, if I can call it this, my world to connect with your world. And that in and of itself is not the objective. The objective there is a very simple economic paradigm that I work from and is that you cannot out-innovate the planet. You can have the best walled garden app store, it can be, have the most wonderful apps on it, you can have the most fantastic pricing scheme you think people will like, but you cannot out-innovate the planet. And as long as you expose the ecosystem to planetary-wide innovation and market competitive forces, that will iterate to a place where you will always be better but you need to be able to innovate, and that requires failure. And failure connected to a physical device is always expensive, challenging, and time consuming. And that's why I think some of the things which I mentioned in my first statement allows us to get to a point where we can start experimenting with some of the economic paradigms of 6G without actually having to wait 10 years for a standard. Because you can actually take something, fiddle with a waveform, and see if it's helpful. You can actually take something, connect AI to a radio, and see if people are interested in counting the number of penguins that cross the street in front of a camera or not, okay. without having to standardize that. Um, because that's how we discover, and that's how we understand what actually the need of the customers are. And I think that's, I mean, you made the comment, should we not have 5.1G, 5.2G, 5.3, 5.4, 5.5? And at some point, we'll get to six. 
Uh, I mean, that, that is something that, that really resonated with me, is the incremental imp improvement of parts of the domain where you can take leverage and benefit from innovation in a specific component. Take it and bank it and use it and move on to the next one. You don't have to wait for the entire ecosystem to change. And whether it's a waveform, it's a waveform. Waveform means we need to ask some chip makers to make a new chip, so that's three years, but it's not 10. Um, and that allows us, I think, to start to experiment with that okay. in a better fashion. So, Jefferson, you made a comment about um, the telcos giving up certain amount of control by going to these flat rate all-you-can-eat offers, okay? I have a similar question about um, the evolution to cloud native and AI native and the relationship between the, 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 the telcos and the hyperscale of the cloud providers. How is that competitive boundary going to shift? Yeah, like, are, are the telcos giving up ground? And, and we, you know, we've got both sides of the, the table here, so very, you're getting advance warning on that question. Very provocative question. <laughs> I, I don't think that when you look at Okay, let's start with the DNA of a hyperscaler, right? The DNA of a hyperscaler right now, for now, is to increase workloads so that there is more on the cloud so that they can leverage the data and turn it into analytics for operations or other pieces, right? So if you, if you go by that thesis and you say that is the objective, then you look at what a traditional telecom provider does and you would say there's an incredible amount of data. I mean, the old school CDRs, EDRs, uh, customer care relationships and contact points. There's an incredible amount of data, but that doesn't necessarily feed the thesis of what a hyperscaler wants. So if you, if you're, if I were betting that hyperscalers are going to want to take over every telco network in the world, I would say that's probably a difficult proposition, right? It's a, it's very hard to run a five nines telco grade network, and it's an incredible amount of complexity. Now we are helping hyperscalers run their internet backbones, and that also is a very complex network, but it's a little bit different than a telco network. But if, okay, so now let, let's establish that you know, thesis. Okay, now what ground are you seeding in this frenemy model, right? Okay, so now if you look at where telcos are looking to transform, if it's difficult to monetize on a heavy investment that's constantly being used, your, your opportunity is do you find new customers? Do you find new experiences? Do you monetize your network east-west? Or do you figure out how to make better partnerships so that you can participate in a value chain, not be the only value chain yourself? Those are pretty much your, your options, right? So if it is participate in a value chain for hyperscalers, what do you contribute to a platform business and how do you become a platform business? So in, in a telco, when I, when I grew up in telco, it was an MRC. That was like the lifeblood. Like we had to create a monthly recurring cost. And if you sneezed, I was going to monetize that sneeze. But now it's if we are going to turn into a platform business, then it's engagement. So that's a different measure, right? Engagement is how many times are you interacting with Eben's APIs? How many times am I on your platform? How much engagement am I creating so that you can take that information and turn it into your direct monetization or adjacencies? So now you look at what's the relationship between what hyperscalers want and telcos want. They want to connect edge to cloud. They want to take data off of whatever sensor it is and bring it into a workload. And, they, and some of that happens to be in telco cloud with, with some of the stuff you're doing with AWS. Some of that happens to be at the experience layer and the solution layer. And some of that happens to be at the device layer. You start to now see when we looked at release uh, 18, right, non-terrestrial networks that you mentioned, now we're starting to see if telcos can't get there on the terrestrial network, does Amazon Kuiper, does Starlink, do they have to make relationships with telcos differently? And that's where it becomes interesting, right? So you're now starting to see connectivity convergence between Leo's plus non-terrestrial and ter plus terrestrial networks. You're starting to see the participation inside the core network. You're starting to see participation even at the RAN layer, right, supporting the RAN layer. And now you're starting to see participation at the AI of the data itself. So now you're starting to see a lot of interesting things, which allows you to do cloud native tools, which allows you to make those transformations, allows you to build on top of it. So it's a very provocative question. Any thoughts, Evan? Yeah, just to your NTN question, um, for the purists in the room will, will know that the, the 5G standard or even the 4G standard that we have is a way, way, way too fat a protocol to ever attempt to try and do that from a satellite to Earth. 
standardization would be very useful to create an entirely new standard that allows us emergency communications and high-speed communications, two completely mm. different things that we need to, to be able to do with end-to-end, -end. but you can, you can do some amazing, amazing things if you do that. Um, I think the paradigm, you, you've struck it down twice, and that is this concept of customers want solutions, they don't want data anymore, they don't want to fight, and the only way you're going to do that is in partnership. Um, and it's at least my experience from the continents that I've worked on that telcos tend to not play nice with others. Uh, they tend to want to be in too much control of the end-to-end -end ecosystem. They want to own the billing relationship with the customer. They're very hard to work with. It's very difficult to integrate because it's these very complicated vertical IT integration stacks uh, that sometimes uses not even standardized protocols, so it's very slow. Um, and if you relieve yourself of the burden think that that's the only way that value can be, be created. And you winning, implying I lose, mm. if you let go of that, um, absolutely I think there is a space to innovate at a much, much greater pace. As long as each individual is clear on how they're creating value. If I allow myself the ability to have a discussion with a provider of services and another provider of services and a provider of infrastructure or connectivity or something else, and they can spin up as fast as they want to, that will not deprive me of the ability to grow. I think that will allow us to then, as operators, do this east-west integration, which will then allow these domains in their respective regards to grow a lot faster than they do today. Because I think people hold on to the idea that if you win, it necessarily implies I must lose. Mm -hmm. I think the way that the internet has developed and the way interdependence there has developed has shown that that's not necessarily the case. It can happen, of course it can happen, um, but it's not necessarily the case. There is okay. absolutely a case where I think that those things can be independent of each other and they don't have to be, let me use the word, parasitic. Very good. I'll, okay. I'll make a small comment since you talked about hyperscalers. You're talking about how they relate to telco, but I'm thinking about how they relate to device, and Jeff sort of mentioned that, that if you have the ability for them to talk to device directly, they can do things with that. Actually, as they are looking at more and more compute, ideally, you know, uh, Jeff mentioned that you, they would like to suck all the data, do all the, all the compute there, but really, there are so many devices, they have so much compute power, if they can, they would like to leverage that capability. Okay, all right, so uh, three-way tango. Um, okay, um, switching on to a different topic, you know, this is about how do we make the 6G transformation profitable, and we tend to think of profitability in a, in a commercial sense, but with 6G, we are starting to be concerned about um, societal issues, and there's also a much bigger role for government in what's going on with 6G. So we have to broaden the term profitability. Now, um, the US government is actively involved, and, and you can talk about the, 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 the work you've been doing on uh, Open RAN in a moment. <clears throat> but I'm going to kind of like go across the world and, and pitch this question to, uh, to Rajesh. The, the Indian government has said that they're aiming to account for India, to, for India to account for 10% of all 6G patents. So, that's another way of looking at profitability from a government policy point of view. What kind of an ecosystem, I mean, you guys do this all the time, right? You're inventing patents and license, but what kind of an ecosystem would India have to put in place to, to, to get to 10%? Is, is that like a, a okay. sensible that's number? A, that's, right? a, that's a very hard question, actually, as to how to make that happen. As I look at it, when, when, when I look at what my team does, you know, research innovation, take it to standards, and, you know, monetize through licensing, um, the best thing that, in, that any government can do is to make sure that keep a level, level playing field for everybody, okay? So if you, if you come up with the best ideas, you, you get rewarded for that, okay? Um, India has specifically said that they wanted to have 10% of, of patents on 6G. Um, honestly, I don't know what that means, because does that mean that a company that's headquartered in India, those sh should add up to 10%? How much do they add up to right now? And then, um, you know, 
6G patterns are not just on 6G. A lot of 5G patterns are going to read on 6G, right? So if you get, want to get to 10% exactly what that means, honestly, I think a better aim would be for any government to sort of come up with a level playing field so that um, whether you're a small company or a big company, if you come up with the good ideas, you can actually contribute that to, that to standards. And one other thing that I will mention, and it's not just about India, there are other countries, there are different tensions that are going on and people always talk about, are you going to have bifurcated standards? And uh, when I think about all of these things, um, one of the best things that, had ha that has happened in this, in this industry is that there's a single standard. I take my phone, no matter where I take it, I don't have to worry about it, it works. You know, not that long ago, I would take two phones, and even then, both of them will not work depending upon which countries you're going to, okay? So, um, so uh, you know, I, I can't really comment on exactly what India is thinking that when they say that they want to, you know, own 10% of the patents, but I'd rather government get, get together to make sure the level, uh, to level the playing field so that uh, whether you're a small research company or a large, research, large company, you can contribute to the better development of technology. Evan, I'm going to ask you just to talk a little bit about what's going on with uh, between EchoStar and you know government, what the U.S. government is doing on Open Run. But while he's answering that, please put your hand up. Uh, we're going to take one or two questions uh, after Evan's spoken. So, not Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> um, so January, the government awarded the NOFO one award for, for testing on Open RAN, uh, and we put forward our uh, proposal for something that we call ORCID, uh, which is a, 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 the only lab in the world where you can test on a live production network. So it's a lab that is independent, uh, secure, that allows you to test uh, RAN, RU, uh, CU, and DU software on the equipment in a software like CICD pipeline. So we've created uh, closed loops between actual hardware input and hardware output back into software so that this can all be done remotely, it can be automated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's running on our actual production network. So if you get a green light at the end of the test, it means that whatever you've pushed into this thing actually physically works on a live production open RAN network. The purpose of that uh, as most of you know, is to be able to foster the pace of innovation that can take place in those specific domains that we're talking about, which is uh, radio or CU and DU software types, and maybe even RUs, as we've seen with NOFO2. So I think the partnership with government is extremely important because they can be a tremendous catalyst and have the ability to focus things in a very clear fashion to allow that to move. I mean, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of corporations and, and, and companies that have already contacted us that are already testing uh, in, in, in that lab. And I mean, we only went, went live a couple of days ago. So, so the idea was to try and encourage a supply side ecosystem around the open RAN marketplace. And, and you're seeing that from the small, small enterprises that are coming to you. Yeah. You don't have to be an Ericsson now to be able to test extremely uh, complicated use cases against a live network, against production grade hardware. You don't need access to those things yourself anymore. You can so just. Are, are these guys testing applications or are they testing equipment that would be going into the both. Market? both? Both. Okay. Yeah, they're testing both. Okay. Okay. Um, and you don't need a full end to end lab uh, or access to one or pay for access to one, which could be pretty yeah. darn expensive. You have, you have access via this, which will allow us to innovate way, 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 way quicker in the US. Okay. So the government can play a tremendous role in accelerating how these things actually happen. Because like I said, every time you touch hardware, the cycles are longer, the laws of physics are a problem, and when things break, it takes a long time to fix them before you can test again. So that, you know, it's testing against the laws of physics is harder. Okay. Uh, and therefore, anything we can do to help ourselves to accelerate that will help the innovation cycle, which is how we as a species learn. Okay. All right. Uh, do we have any hands up? Oh, there we go. One there. Am I on? Great. First, thanks for all your expertise. It's been a great panel to listen to so far. Uh, I'm Dan Henry. Uh, I work right across the street at NTIA. Uh, not for the Innovation Fund, though, to be clear, so I'm not giving out any money here, uh, nor am I capable of. I don't even have my wallet. Um, so this is a fun one. Uh, in terms of business models, uh, 
integrated sensing. Who am I buying it from? Who is selling it? What is the what is the sort of business stack look like? Because it's something where you're going straight to an M and O to purchase sensing services for I don't know your housing association or your college campus or is there a middleman in there who is you know perhaps uh, more willing to build up the line of business right to go out and and do the the orchestration and the management of of a sensing solution right perhaps across multiple carriers, right? So that you, you can get continent, continuity of your sensing service across your entire corporate campus or your gated village uh, in Central Florida. Very specific on Central Florida. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think in the end, it, it really comes down to one, you, you made a couple nuances into your use case, right? Like, does it cross boundaries where you need reliability and redundancy? Is it something that's really just localized where you know one operator has good coverage, but in, in the end, right, you could go to a number of places, and I, I think that's the beauty. When you give customers choice, right, ultimately that's what you want to do. You want to be able to give it choice. You want to make sure it's a fair price. You want to make sure it's delivered easily. Right now, we're not quite there, right? So, so I'll give you an example. Uh, together now, right now, they could go right to EchoStar, and EchoStar may be able to have the sensor already verified on their network, and they might need a distributor, who's another party, that actually sends it out, but then they need a field force to be able to install it, test it, and turn it up, and then maybe EchoStar does the management. Maybe you come right to Accenture and say, well, Accenture, you're already doing the ERP integration of our, you know, back-end enterprise. An extension of that is we want to add this new value case, which is sensors as a service, right? Can you figure out who is the best operator that has the best spectrum position? What's the best sensor? How do you package it together? And do you put an application on top of that, like a data management platform on top of that sensor? But because it's so complex, now I think that the business model innovation is almost as important as the technology innovation. The, the technology, the technology you heard, Evan and um, Rajesh, that we can do a lot with the tech as is, but we haven't figured out an easy way to not margin stack we haven't figured out an easy way to have one contract instead of three. We haven't figured out, you use the word orchestration, we haven't figured out how, who's the front door on orchestrating that, and then how do you do the supply chain, delivery, test, turn up, site walk, all those things. But I think that's the exciting part. Like, we have a lot of opportunity to simplify that. Yeah, I, for me, the ideal, the dot on the horizon is you should be buying that from the innovator that understands you the best. If that's the ERP provider, then buy it from them. We do more than ERP, man. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> if, if it's a network provider, fine. If it's the provider of mining drill bits, then it's them. Because today, the experience that at least I have as an extremely poor example is credit. The credit can be, I, I can get credit everywhere. I go to a sportsman's warehouse because I want shoes. So I can go there and I can get the shoes or I can click here and then I can pay four times. So there's, there's, there's a disintermediation that's happened. There's a liberalization that's happened of this credit. So ideally, you need to be able to buy from the innovator that understands you the best. It would be my hope that that would create an economic disposition where you basically just pour jet fuel on the whole disposition and everybody can move at the highest possible pace. Because if problems can be met with an innovator that understands that problem and that paradigm, I think we have a very good chance of accelerating at very high pace. If things have to sit in fortresses and they have to be doled out from fortresses, I think the whole ecosystem will remain anemic. That would be my f philosophical hope, I guess. I'll just make one comment that uh, I'm just excited that uh, with everybody thinking about integrating sensing and communication, everybody will have a device that can do the sensing, yes. okay? Because just like, you know, in old days you had a camera, you had a phone, when they got together and they go, what am I gonna do with this stupid phone? It doesn't really work so well, well with the camera on the phone, and lo and behold, you have TikTok 10 years later and all of that stuff. So I, I'm sure a lot of stuff can be done, uh, and these guys will solve the problems as to exactly where you go to buy that. Okay, a question in the corner there. Yeah, this is Amitabha from Nokia, and my question is pretty simple, right? 
So most of the value creation is from the MNOs, and the main use cases are EMDD and to some extent fixed wireless access. In 6G also, we are looking at the seven gigahertz band where you need more bandwidth so we can support EMDD services better. So what else, you, what other use cases, I mean, we looked at verticals in 5G, never panned out. So do you have any forecast that what other use cases will create economic value similar to EMDD and fixed wireless access? So I'll take a stab at it. My, my view is the following. Um, as long as there is a linear relationship between the amount of hours that a human being is spending interacting with a service, the need for spectral growth will be limited. Um, but the moment there becomes a disconnection between the amount of linear hours a human being is actually activating the use of spectrum, that is when you are going to need an exponential larger amount of bandwidth. Uh, and fiber will always be part of that. Because as I'm sitting here right now, there's a tablet in my bag that's talking to a piece of cloud software about work or emails. And if that tablet starts to be able to become semi-intelligent with some machine learning or with some AI, which most of us can access today, or a large language algorithm, and there is another device at my house that can start to recognize images, and those devices can start to interact with each other at a semi-intelligent and eventually an intelligent basis. There's a non-linear relationship. My amount of person hours invested in connecting to that is no longer relevant. The second when that happens, we can have machines doing intelligent things with machines. Some of those will have to be wireless. And the moment that happens, there will be this exponential proliferation of services uh, of possibilities, of solutions you can find, because these machines can be trained to do fantastic things for us uh, in an incredibly high pace where we do not have to interact with them. We're grown up in an era where there's a linear relationship between the two. The amount of Netflix that I watch, there's a, there's a limited amount that I can do, and therefore there's a limited amount of bandwidth ultimately that's available because my eyes cannot recognize a higher resolution than, than X, so there's a limit on the bandwidth. But at some point in time, that I think will become disconnected. And then that's where I think the, the possibility for additional services will become available. So I don't think it's the use cases themselves. I think it's the catalyst that AI throws into what will happen with creativity. So we have to have Skynet to make it <laughs> realizable. I think we've had Skynet oh. for quite a while already. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just gonna ask one. You know, a lot of our discussion is predicated on consumers and mobile broadband, but your enterprise customers care about more than mobile broadband, right? There are monetization opportunities. I don't know if you can comment on how the communications providers could broaden their portfolio beyond high-speed connectivity. Yeah, it's definitely, when you think about what enterprise clients have been asking us for, they already have this call it a cocktail of connectivity, right? They've got, the utilities industry has had 700 and 900 uh, already. The, um, the, the other players have had LoRa and unlicensed Spectrum already. They've, they've had Wi-Fi 6, and there's challenges related to all of them. And they've said, all we're trying to do is improve our OT, our, our operational technologies, whether it's to drive more yield, whether it's to cut costs or shave time off or, or kind of automate things, right? So w within that, when you look at that, there, there is definitely kind of almost like a, a horizontal set of use cases that we've been thinking about, and that's what we've had success on. So we've deployed across industries on things like worker safety, because ultimately worker safety is something that if you were in manufacturing, it's just as important if you're on an oil and gas rig, which is just as important if you're in the field in utilities. We've worked on video analytics quality assurance which is, again, as important when you look across a manufacturing line moving really fast um, or, or in an automobile plant. Um, and we've looked at things like mission critical push to talk, so things where it doesn't matter if you have to pick up a phone, dial it, or hit speed dial, you can just you know, ping somebody and then you have um, push to talk. But that, each one of those has like a very specific reason why we're having success on that. For example, 
mission critical push to talk, you would imagine like that died with Nextel, but that's because Motorola had an LMR standard that never evolved past push to talk, right? And now with IP based and with better networks, we can do push to X. So now okay. we can push to voice, push to video, push to text, push to those things, and that has a really good use case. When you look at quality assurance, again, the, the premise that we had was when we went into these plants, um, generally plant manufacturers are working on three shifts per day, and that's essentially, they're just trying to increase yield off three shifts per day, but there's always three people looking at a line. That's you know one person making sure that the quality assurance is right, there's someone backing them up and they're running three shifts, that's six people, two people per shift, and that's six people, and they're having a hard time recruiting for that because no one wants to look at quality assurance spot picking, right? So when we put in a private 5G network, we put in edge compute next to it, we put on the actual computer vision that we built next to it, then we actually, you have to, this here's the other trick, you have to upskill those six people. Yeah. You can't just replace the six people because everybody's up in arms, you have unions, you have everybody up in arms. So you have to actually then change manage it. So then not only do you put in the technology and you put together the solution, you do the business case, then you deploy it, then you gotta upskill, what are those six people gonna do, right? Okay. One person actually stays and actually trains the model, but then the other five you upskill into, okay. what's the next thing? So that's where we've had. Okay, we're gonna go into a quick fire round. I'm gonna ask you about the last question, what you're doing about 6G, but before that, um, we've really scratched the surface of what it's gonna to take to make this transition, to do it in a way that's profitable and, and ensures that the, if you like, the industry chain is, is um, you know, quite very vibrant. In preparing for this <clears throat> panel, I talked to about 20 people from around the world, and Alex has kindly published this report, um, which is available on the 60 World website, that goes into much more detail about the opportunities, challenges, and the transition model, I guess, for the industry to 5G. So do uh, go, go up and um, uh, download a copy. The last question for each person is, what is your organization doing about 6G and what would you advise people in the, order, in the audience to do about 6G? I don't know, who, who wants to start? I can start. We are making sure that we are doing the research that needs to be done right now so that when the 6G standard work needs to be done, we are ready for it. And we want to, and we want to make sure that 6G is the best that it can be. And uh, Amitabha, you are way too pessimistic. Come on, uh, we are so spoiled that because you know we have sold a, a, a smartphone to every man, woman, and child on the planet, and we want the next vertical to be as big in just a few years. Give it a little time. <laughs> okay. um, standards matter. Uh, we heavily, heavily contribute to Tomara, to Open RAN, to 3GPP, et cetera. They, they really matter. Lean in to standards, make them happen. I think that's, that's super important. Um, the other one is uh, the, the, the transition to, to cloud, to IT-centric networks is a painful one, but it's not gonna go away if we don't start. So lean into virtualization, integrating CI/CD pipelines, and the most important thing of, I think, everything that was said was, was retraining helping your, your workforce be excited about that and helping people to be able to embrace the, the, the new things of what we're doing. So, you know, the lean in is, is, is very important. And the last thing that I would say is the best product is built when you speak to customers. Yeah. You speak to people, understand what the challenges that they're facing, understand how verticals complement each other, understand how verticals are different, because in understanding what are the challenges that we're actually trying to solve, we will educate the engineers that work on standards to be able to do things that are actually highly, highly, highly relevant, and then in the end, usable. Okay, you've got 30 seconds. Uh, 30 <laughs> seconds. Uh, same things, right? Like, I would say Accenture believes everything that Eden just said. We're involved at TM Forum at the board level. I'm on the board of ION. Um, we're working on 3G PP standards and heavily contributing to it, so I think standards are incredibly important to keep an eye on what's going on. We've actually changed our entire operating model to get ready for this, so to Eden's point, our whole cloud-first model, right? I have a network organization but now, when it comes to cloud native and cloud solutions, like now we have that together in the same organization to make sure that our operating ready model is prepared for that, um, and then making sure that we're talking to our 9,000 clients. Very good. Okay, thank you to the panelists. Thank you.